So I had a holiday booked to France um, with the family. Didn't quite go as expected. Um, the reason it didn't go quite as expected is because I ended up dragging that 1,600 miles there and back. So why did I end up driving this all the way around France? Well, the simple fact of the matter was, this wasn't meant to go to France at all. Um, what had actually happened in that a rare moment of organization, um, I'd been working on a family car, which is uh, a Ford S-Max, um, and trying to get that ready to go on a holiday around France. And that involved getting the aircon regassed, putting some new ditch finders on the back, changing uh, an oil separator diaphragm, which is a common problem on the Volvo uh, 2.5 five pot engine, which is what it has. Um, doing an oil change on it and some service bits and bobs, just generally going around it. We gave it a clean, uh, it doesn't get many of them. And yeah, wanted to basically have the car ready to go, have it ready to set sail um, with no issues at all. And which it, it has always done. We've taken that car to France many times, but this time, it was different. Uh, what actually happened was we set sail from home at some silly o'clock in the morning and started heading up the M27 towards the A3. And on the M27, we heard a screeching noise coming from the back of the car. Uh, and my wife turned to me straight away and said, that's the screeching noise I've been telling you about. And she had been telling me about a screeching noise, but I hadn't heard it. I mean, I had heard it, actually. I had heard it on the way out of London months ago, um, but I hadn't had it replicate it with me. I hadn't felt the car do it. I couldn't, it couldn't show me that noise so that I could diagnose it. Um, and what it tends to be in that car is it's got some dust shields that go around the back of the brake discs and they sometimes they're a bit rusty and a bit grotty because Ford and uh, they just get misshapen and you know they bend and they touch the disc sometimes and you get a screeching noise that's quite common. So you don't think too much of it. Um, so we're driving up the A3, having noticed the screeching noise on the M27 and thought, well, hopefully it will go away, which it did. It was pretty intermittent. Um, up the A3, I turned to my kids and say, oh, look, this is the garage Mike Hawthorne um, went to before he crashed and died. Around that time, it started stuttering, started misfiring and playing up. Um, not constantly, but enough to think, I've got to do 1,600 miles in this roughly so we pull over have a look and it was at that moment i could smell the rear brake the squealing noise was a seized rear caliper the second seized rear caliper that car's had having stopped to try and figure out what the problem might be because i'd had the air filter out and i'd done that oil uh, separator diaphragm and the pcv valve and i'd had various um, things unplugged and i thought maybe something's not connected quite right but everything was and it all looked fine so we carried on, my wife had been driving, I took over, it kept on doing it. So you're driving up the A3 to the M25 and you think, what do you do? You are in a people carrier, an MPV. You've got a family of five, two 13 year olds and a 10 year old. This is the perfect vehicle for it. Three full size seats in the boot, air conditioning, cruise control, everything's already packed in it. What do you do? Do you trust that car, even though it's not got off the first main road and already it started playing up? Or do you abort the holiday completely? Or third option, do you go home and fetch your 750 pound Citroen C6? Well, obviously that's what we opted to do. Um, the problem with this is that the Citroen C6 wasn't exactly ready for the job um, and by not ready for the job I mean I haven't actually done anything since I got it back from Hubnut who broke it he didn't break it but he he brought it back and it had uh, an ABS fault come up which in turn had thrown on the traction control light and the handbrake had stopped working because why wouldn't it so it had problems uh, hadn't it's had an oil change but I mean the last time the bonnet was opened was probably before he took it the aircon is non-functioning and we were told that another heat wave was coming and the seats in the back, despite the fact this is a large car, um, well they are large, two of them, the third one, as in the one in the middle, isn't really a seat, it's a jump seat, it's just a temporary thing um, and we were going to be doing, well we knew about 1500 miles we thought, 
we had to make the decision, and the decision was to take the C6 because I had more faith in this, knowing that Ian had just taken it up to Wales and back, and then I'd taken it to Lincolnshire and back the day, um, a few days later. We kind of had the more faith in this. Um, we thought this one's got more chance of making it. There is also a chance it might be slightly more economical because on a run this actually isn't that bad. So yeah, we went back and thought, right, let's move our tunnel, which costs 50 quid to move tunnel and change the registration number. Route turn, go back, get this, head back to France. The kids weren't enamored with it, it has to be said, because they knew that it was gonna be uncomfortable for one of them. And we were also concerned about the size of the boot, being that the S-Max has a much bigger boot than this does. So having arrived at the Aero Tunnel, I have to admit, I was feeling a little excited. Uh, the prospects of taking this to France, that's something that I always wanted to do. And to be honest, I was never sure I would do. Um, because if I was going there on a jolly, I'd probably take a BX or, even Clement and Clement's working or something like that, you know, or the Imp, I always fancy taking the Imp over the front. Um, but yeah, there we go. We've got, we've got, our, we've got our choice of to fill it up with fuel, 110 pounds. Um, and it wasn't even empty. So the excited side of me was all about it, trying to jump on the train, board it, get it to France, sit in there and start changing the clocks over to read kilometers per hour, not miles an hour. I was excited. I was actually thinking, you know, for everyone else, this is gonna be a rough time because my wife's got stuff in her feet. She hasn't got a footwell anymore. The boot is absolutely ram packed. The kids are in the back. One of them hasn't got any seat space either side of them and is sitting on seat belts. None of them have any leg room because everything's in the footwell as well because we overpacked like you do. Um, but I was all right, because I was driving my C6, so I was quite enjoying it. So we got to France, and I thought, well, how am I going to be received in France? Because I've heard stories that when you drive down one of the uh, auto routes, um, or payages, or something like that, in one of these, a dark coloured C6, and you're licking on, people see you come in, and, and they move over. We do not care. Anyway, so the C6 wasn't particularly well received in France, um, but we made our way down to Rouen for the first night. Um, we were staying in an apartment, which was interesting. Interesting. Yeah, let's go with interesting. Having had some sleep in the apartment, we left the next day and what we were doing was heading from Rouen down to, they call it, I, would, I thought it was Vendy, but they call, everyone seems to call it the Vendy. But uh, I wasn't fussed about that because we were in Rouen, so I wanted to do the Rouen Des Les Arts, Des Les Arts, Des Les Arts, uh, old race circuit. The one that used to be an F1 track up until 1968, I think it was, when uh, I think Joe Schesler died there. Um, just because it was so bloody fast. It was, like, it was like Spa in places, the old road circuit. It was just really, really fast. And you had these downhill sections through forests and things like that, and it was, make a mistake and you've had it. Um, and then I think F2 carried on there until 1974. And I think the last event was held there in 1993. A road circuit, it was a road course. Um, they just close it for, for racing. But Rouen was a, a, a sort of a historical capital of motorsport, so it was important to go there. It would have been nice to go around the town as well and have a look about, um, but we didn't have time because the day before we didn't get there till late because we caught a train that was at about 11 o'clock, not eight o'clock or whatever it was supposed to be. And we'd lost a lot of time doing that. So we basically got to Rouen, went back out, went to a Burger King, turned around, came back out. In fact, I took a picture of the C6 in the car park at Burger King with a nice sunset behind it. Very picturesque. Um, so yeah, the next day out of there, we knew we were heading down to the Vendy, but we thought, well, I'll do a couple of circuits to the track. And I've got to be honest, it's a real shame that there's nothing left of the track at Rouen. Um, I mean, there are a couple of artifacts. There's a couple of little clues that it was there, but they're few and far between. You have to go looking for them. And sadly, there's a bit that would have been part of the circuit is now just kind of like a walkable footpath. Um, the top, it's almost like a triangle, the circuit, a bit like REMS really. It's REMS. It's, uh, yeah, it's kind of like a triangle. And the top bit would have been good to walk it, but we didn't have the time. Um, and I also had a family of not bothered people about walking that. Um, fine. Uh, it's not very far away. I can always go back there. Uh, the C6 is doing quite well up to this point. Um, drove over quite happily, no issues. Showing what a cruiser it is. It was uh, 
it's a better cruiser than the S-Max. I mean, the S-Max actually isn't bad for a people carrier. It's, it's got the 2.5 lump in it, very, very smooth, very tall gearing. It just sits there and just, just hums along. Um, but this is, yeah, on the motorway, that's quicker. Um, that has got m so much grunt, so much overtaking grunt. It doesn't need to change down a cog to overtake. It's just to give it a little squirt, no matter what speed you're doing, give it a bit more and off it goes. Um, on the motorway, it really, really comes alive, this car. And we'll do a proper test on this one day, but yeah, basic long and short of it is, it makes a lot of sense on a motorway. Not so much sense around town, which is where I predominantly use it. So we got Rouen done, and then after that, it was time to bomb it down to the Vendi, which was quite a trek. Um, there were a few things I wanted to do down there. Main thing was to visit Saint Nazaire, but uh, I realised again I was probably in the minority on that, so I didn't get a chance to take it to Saint Nazaire. But I will go back there one day um, because it was the site of uh, a raid by British commandos on a dry dock. If you don't know it, Clarkson did a programme on it. It's on YouTube, and in fact, it's so good, I'll link it somewhere on the screen. Um, it's just the great, they call it the greatest raid that no one's ever heard of. It's awesome. It's such a cool story. Well, it's true, it's not a story. Um, back in World War II. While in the Vendi, we swung by L'Auto de Musée, I think it was, um, in Vendi, which was a quaint little museum, um, quite oldie worldy inside. Uh, to be honest, it was, it was one of those things where you walk around everything and you try and take everything in and then you get out and you go and then you read something online and you think, oh hang on, did they have that car there? And I'd literally done this. I, I, I left um, the museum, I went home, uh, back to the uh, campsite, I picked up a book and started having a beer and reading the book, uh, a book on Andre Lefebvre, and then the, designed the DS and the traction and 2CV and lots of other cool stuff. And, uh, and I saw his work on uh, Voisin, 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 some um, uh, cars back in the 20s and thought, did they have one of those there? It was the same day. So uh, yeah, sleeve valve engine's very cool. Worth looking up. Yeah, the museum was pretty good. Um, there was a Clement there. Not Clement, but there was a Clement replica. Some might say a more notable. Uh, version because it was an ID and it was from the 60s and it was red and not bad and in the museum in France but yeah there was other stuff there, there was traction convertible lots of cool vintage stuff there uh, Delahaye's, Delage, Panard, no SM's, a bit disappointing, um, no BX's either funnily but there was a Fiat Barchetta in the workshop being fixed being done up. Um, a lot of the cars weren't restored, kind of original, quite a quaint place, quite a bit of money to get in for what it is, but that museum receives no state aid or sponsorship or anything like that, apparently, from the tourism board, so you know, they have to charge what they need to to, to make it work. And the collection is, uh, was originally owned by um, a family, and when the older generation of that family died, the youngsters, who are now not youngsters, um, took it over it, you know, because they, they wanted to see their passion continued, even though they, they may not have known much about it, I don't know, but that's the story I've heard, is they didn't know a huge amount, and they took, up, took it on to preserve it, which is brilliant. So yeah, I'd recommend going there. I wouldn't say it was big enough to warrant a special trip to it, but definitely recommend it if you're in that area, swinging by it. It's, it's quite a quaint little place. Definitely worth visiting. A couple of pictures of the C6 on the outside, naturally. Uh, after the museum in Vendi, uh, it was standard holiday fare along the coast, down to the beach, um, in the middle of a heat wave, <coughs> and try to bury my youngest son in the sand. I mean, why not? Uh, and then it was back, um, back to the campsite. Um, we did a few days down in the Vendi area, and then after that, we headed back up, all the way back up. Um, to, uh, I can't even remember the name of <laughs> the region it's in now, northeast of Paris. I'll write it on the thing. I can't remember what department it was, but of course on the way there, halfway, Le Mans. And we've already been to Le Mans. Um, we went in the S-Max. 
And I love Le Mans. I absolutely love Le Mans. I'm not massively into the 24 hours as it is now, but the history of it and everything, and previous cars, Matras particularly, um, yeah, I find it fascinating. Um, and we swung by Le Mans, um, where there was a 24 hour cycle event on. Not motorcycles, bicycles going around, I mean, I don't know if they're just going around the Bugatti circuit or something, but they're riding around the track. It's just look punishing. So I went to Le Mans, main reason was to go to the museum. Um, the last time I went to that museum, they had an SM. Did I mention that? And my wife took a picture of me sat forlornly, just looking at it. And there was a DS next to it, and a 2CV, and some other stuff. No, an attraction, sorry, there were 2CVs, they were on the other side. I think it was a six as well, the traction. I think it was a 15 CV. Um, and yeah, of course, little did I know that the next time I visited that museum, I would own an SM and a Clement. Not a DS, just a Clement, but it's close. Um, so we went back to the museum. Had a, I love the Le Mans Museum, I really do. But yeah, you know, it's a fantastic museum. I love that place, absolutely love it. It's good value too. Um, so it's just a brilliant place, Le Mans, the circuit, the pits, everything. The last time I went there, we went there and it was cooler and there was no one around, it was deserted and it was, I actually preferred that. Uh, this time there were a lot of people there, but yeah, I went up to Le Mans and of course, having done that, I had to go in the gift shop and buy a sticker, which I could adorn the C6 with. Once it had done a lap, obviously, of the track, or maybe not the whole track, but most of the track. Um, sounds quite dramatic, don't forget those are cheap, awful tyres in the front of this. The back ones aren't too bad, the fronts are horrendous. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, a lot of motorbikers there finding it very funny watching someone trying to hustle this along. It's like, it's like trying to enter a speedboat race for the cruise liner. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was good. But yeah, Le Mans, brilliant. So it's now done a lap of Rouen and a lap of Le Mans. Well, it's actually done a few laps of Le Mans. Yeah, some of those bugs might have come from there. But yeah, magical place, absolutely love it. And of course that was halfway to our next stop. Um, we did three nights in a campsite down on the Vend in the Vendée and then three up on the north east of Paris. And of course, what's in Paris? You've got to go to Paris. You've got to take a picture of this next to the Eiffel Tower. You've got to find a free parking, no, yeah, a free parking spot on a Sunday that no one else seems to notice, but is right next to the tower. And no, there's always spaces in it. And you think they're queuing up to park in side streets away from the tower. They haven't realized that there are spaces near the tower. Um, and I grounded the chin out coming out of this car park. So it's got a bit of a dip. And uh, when my wife, got a picture of the car in front of the Eiffel Tower. Um, you can see the bit of trim hanging off the bottom of the car um, because it just ripped it off. I mean, if only that car had adjustable suspension that you could raise so that it wouldn't chin itself coming out of a car park. So we, uh, yeah, went to the Eiffel Tower and everything like that. And of course, no trip to Paris would be complete without actually, for me, breaking my cherry at this, visiting the Holy Grail, Parc Andre Citroen is now one of my favorite places on earth. Uh, very odd, if you hadn't told me that's where the Citroen factory that built Clement and the SM, and God knows how many other um, Citroens over the years, if you hadn't told me that's where it was situated, it, it, it would have taken away some of the magic, I admittedly, but the place itself was just, considering it's in a city center, it's just so calm, so chilled out. I've, I've not seen anything like it, actually. Um, it's a really interesting place. It's basically the site of the former Quai de Javel factory um, in which DSs and SMs were made and tractions and a lot of stuff before that. And it, it got closed down eventually when Citroen took over the site at Aulnay uh, sur Bois. All Ney, um, which is where the CX was produced and AX, so lots of stuff after that. So they basically just ran with Ren and Aulnay as the primary two in France, and now they're branching out more. And Aulnay got closed, and most of that's been bulldozed, but that's where the Conservatoire is. Um, I have to go to that one day again. Um, Ren's still going, where the BX and this old girl were made in Ren. Um, still going at the moment. 
don't know how long that'll go for. Uh, I hope I hope a long time, but because um, it's a, it's a good source of employment for the locals. But um, the site in Paris, that's the magical one. It's uh, it was a plot of land on the, the bank of the river Seine. Seine. I don't actually know how to pronounce it. Seine. Um, the big river that goes through Paris, basically. It was right on the bank of it. It had a railway line going by it. it had Boats obviously could come in and drop off materials and, and things like that. I think even cars used to leave on barges at one point. Um, it was, uh, I think he got that, and where did he get that factory from? I think he got that site when he bought into, or he bought, took over another small French car company because there were hundreds of them. Um, I can't remember. But yeah, that, that, that factory there basically was the factory that was the really cool it's the one where he had uh he invented so many things he operated from there he um that's where i made the decision to light up the eiffel tower with the word citron down it and he had a daycare in there daycare not american he had a nursery in there um that you know the kids would go into while the parents were working schools it was revolutionary stuff um but obviously as time went on oh dear. where there's blame um yeah, obviously as time went on, uh, it just became too small, it was too cramped, the land was worth too much. Um, although, <laughs> they've never actually built anything on it. It's just a park now, and, and underneath that park is a, multi, is a not a multi-storey, but underneath that park is a car park. So this parked, I didn't realise it was right underneath um, the site of the park. Uh, you go under a tunnel, it's actually quite difficult to find, find the car park, but you go under a tunnel, um, along a road called Rue Andre Citroen. And then, uh, yeah, the, the car park is called Citroen something or other. And also on the top of that factory site, I found another C6. I saw two other C6s in my time in France, my week there, um, in total. One of them was going on the motorway the other way. We saw the top of it go by. Um, and there was this other one, same color as this, although it looked to be a 2.2 um, manual. Uh, and it had, uh, I think it had the, the law seats, which I was actually quite jealous of because I don't really like leather. You could tell it was a 2.2 because it had little wheels on it, which don't look great. And it had the fixed lip spoiler on the back because it doesn't have the deployable rear aerofoil. Yeah, that's where we went. And I've got to be honest, that place, Parc Andre Citroen, it's just magical to be there, knowing that that's where the SM came from. The S my SM was made there, right where I was in 1972, I would assume. Um, and then Clement, some years later, one of the last ones as well. Um, just so cool to be there. Um, there were two kind of greenhouse type things which had a roof on them that looked really old school and we thought, was that part of the factory? But the rest of it looked too modern. There was a building around there somewhere that was there when the factory was, but unfortunately no real, other than being named after him, it wasn't really anything there to sort of celebrate the cars. You think you'd have some like sculptures around there or something, like in DS shape or whatever. In fact, Paris itself is, is a lovely place, I like it. We, um, we struggled in Paris because what I wanted to do was go into Paris and find Clement-related stuff. Uh, I, I knew I wouldn't find anything SM-related. I did find that metal tin sign um, that I showed you in my, uh, well, I can't remember which video it was, the one where I walked around the SM's bay and showed you what was on the wall. Um, and there was a tin sign in a beautiful place called Danan in Brittany. Uh, Brittany. Um, and found that completely by chance. Um, in Paris, find nothing with a DS on it. Nothing with a DS on it. All the souvenir shops, everything. Beatles, Beatles and two CVs, but most of it was just tat. Um, nothing with DSs, didn't see a DS in Paris. Uh, and it was a busy day in Paris as well, so really surprised by that. Nothing, it was just two CVs, little toy two CVs, that's it. Or maybe like a, a tea towel with a two CV on it or something like that. I mean, that's fine, but like, what about the DS? What attraction? Yeah, I was kind of uh, surprised by that. Uh, regretfully, I didn't remember to find out what Google Translate was for. Um, did I mention that I have an SM um, to French people? Um, because I felt that they needed to know. Um, I'm not entirely sure they would have cared, but 
I, uh, I did consider telling a lot of people that I had an SM. And yeah, I mean, Paris was, yeah, it's a magical place. I love it. I think Paris is great. It's not, you know, there are places I love more, to be honest, it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, and of course, no trip to Paris would have been complete without a run down the Champs-Elysees um, and onto the Arc de Triomphe, where you basically just drive onto it. You don't stop, you just, just round about. You just look, there's loads of cars coming at you in a bundle and you think, oh, I'm just gonna, and you just have to drive like a local. And if you drive like a local, it was amazing. It was straight, it was the easy, one of the easiest things I've done. It was just straight on there, zip, 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 get out of the way, I'm going over there. And if someone's coming alongside you, it was a guy in a Ferrari Testarossa on it. Nutcase, in fact, no, I think well, it was a 512 TR, it was the later front end. Um, yeah, I thought, you nutter. But it was a really bizarre place because we weren't into it to begin with and it was chaos. And then it just suddenly went dead, it did another lap. And it was just dead, <laughs> there was just no one on it. And we were just doing, going round and round and people looking at us going, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, a really bizarre place. But the funny thing with Paris is it's easier to drive through Paris than London, 100%. Because in France, you get very few people on the road who've got an ego. You get very few people on the road, I think, who take being cut up personally. Like if you get cut up or something in France, you just shrug and go, all right, I'll, I'll cut someone up in a minute. It's just the way it is. In England, someone would be getting road rage and spitting out their bacon and whatever slice all over the windscreen and not having it um, because everyone's quite important in their own little world. And in front, you just don't get that feeling in Paris. You, in Paris, it's kind of like, well, someone's cut me up, you know, but it doesn't matter because in a minute I'll do that to someone and they'll go, and, they'll, and I did. And by the end of the day, I was getting quite confident that just driving like a local. I was just cutting people up left, right and center, just zipping out. And, yeah, as long as you indicate, I'm gonna indicate and it's basically like free pass to do what you want. I put my indicator on. I know I drove over the pavement, but I put my indicator on, so you knew I was gonna do it, so it's fine. Um, yeah, it was, I enjoyed it actually, in a weird way. Um, I wouldn't have minded if it picked up a dent, to be honest, because if it picked up a dent on the Arc de Triomphe or something like that, I'd be like, ah. that's what it's meant to do, but it didn't. No one got near it, just straight through. Um, and out of Paris again uh, that night. And uh, yeah, it, it was a great time. It, it was a stressful day, because <laughs> it's like 30 odd degrees and you've got kids who don't want to be crammed in the back of the car kicking off because they're in the back of a car. But uh, yeah, on the whole, the car in Paris, loved it, absolutely loved it. I, and it was great. I felt like a proper French man. And I'll tell you what, if I was in the S-Max, I wouldn't have had the confidence to drive in the way I was doing by the end of it. And the way I was driving by the end of it, it was just like how some woman would drive in Paris if they had a battered C6. And that's what I did. And it just worked, brilliant. Now, obviously, being a car-based channel, um, most of the stuff I'm talking about is stuff we did that was car-related, although we are quite a car -y family, so um, a lot of it was. But, uh, yeah, Paris, and then um, the last day, uh, well, the, yesterday, in fact, because, oh, God, can you get jet lag driving a C6? I can't even remember what day it is. Yeah, yesterday it was. We left where we were staying yesterday, which was about an hour from Rems. Um, which of course is the site of another XF1 track, Rems Gu, I think it is, Gu, Gu, um, Gui, um, yeah, which is, you know, the old pit buildings, you've seen pictures everywhere. Um, and we thought, well, we have to go there. I've done circuits of that track before in the Saxo, um, when we went a couple of years ago, and I decided I'm doing them in this. And uh, the difference this time is that, uh, you're not actually allowed to stop there anymore, which is kind of sad. And I think it's because they used to get hordes of people, car petrol heads, showing up in supercars and motorbikes, superbikes and that kind of thing, all pitching up and just taking over the place and having pictures and everything because it's a fantastic backdrop. It's one of the coolest things you'll find because you've got all the old stands of the pit buildings and everything like that. And a lot of the old, like, um, Sponsors are on there, like Lequip and Elf and everything like that, and it's all kind of age-worn. It is the Clement of pit stop, uh, pit buildings, and uh, it's just a 
coolest place. It really is. It's dripping with history. Fangio's race there, Hawthorne, Moss, you know, you name it. It's, it's all gone on there. Um, you can't drive the whole circuit, um, a bit like Rouen, because there's a dual carriageway that's gone in along one end of it, and there were two variations of it, and that road going in screwed one of the variations, and so there was a second variation. Um, but yeah, you can't drive it. But you can do two bits of it, which are largely the same. But the pit complex itself is just, it's one of the coolest places on earth. It really is, and it's a credit to the volunteers who run it. Um, I follow them on Twitter. Uh, as a society, um, I don't know. I don't think they get any grants. I don't think they get any help. I think it's all voluntary, and they're doing a fantastic job. But one of the problems they've been having is people pulling up, superbikes lining up, and then going frapping it down the road at 15,000 revs with the front wheel off the ground. Locals in the village nearby complaining because, of course, you get people who move next to Goodwood and Thruxton, and they complain about the noise, and you think, well, why did you move next to a racing circuit? Rems isn't a racing circuit anymore, it's just a road. So yeah, fair enough. And the villagers were sort of complaining why are people going past 150 mile an hour, someone's gonna die. And um, so now there are no waiting signs positioned. So basically you're not allowed to stop. There's a gate um, and I, I believe that on certain days when it's open and manned, you can go in there um, and you can walk through it still. There's nothing to stop you doing that. You can walk around and have a look, but you can't stop your car on the side. Well, I did stop the C6 on the side because I thought it's not very boy racer-ish. So like, no one's, you know, I'm not, you're not exactly hacking it around. Um, and I just had to get the pictures. Such a historic place. So having um, got some pictures there, including a, a top-down picture, which replicates one I took with the Saxo when we went there a little while ago, um, and realized how awesome this thing looks from the top. And yeah, that was basically Rems. Um, that's a place I like. It's a clean place. Do you know the funny thing in France, even when we were in Rouen, and I have to be honest, the area we were in was not great. It was quite run down. Well, not run down, it wasn't run down actually. It, it looked, I'm no snob. I'm quite working class, but there are some areas you drive into and you think, if you've got a BX, it's the elbow on the door lock. And it was a bit like that, but no litter. People just didn't litter. There was no litter. There was buses with mint bus stops, like real new fancy modern bus stops with computerized machines in. You could see what you wanted to see. Nothing smashed up. No graffiti on any of that. Graffiti on walls and things, yeah, sure. Like you get on an old wall, but all the proper stuff, all the stuff you need, people needed to go about their daily life and stuff that serves the community was respected. You wouldn't get that over here. Um, I just, I can't help but think life in France is better than it is in the UK. Um, everything's better. The supermarkets, my God, there's the amount of stuff they sell and the quality of it. Um, yeah, it's just, honestly, if I could speak French and we hadn't had kids, I reckon we'd be living there by now. The roads are so much better. But yeah, anyway, sorry, I, I quite like going there. Um, and then I get embarrassed when I come back to the UK and I get off the Euro tunnel and everyone's sat in the wrong lane and you go boom, 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 down this concrete motorway and you think, someone's in you know, the third lane and then there's two lanes there that are empty. You try doing that in France, you'll have someone on your bumper like that with the indicator on. No, it's a fabulous way of life. I, I'm quite jealous of the French. Uh, I really, I like how they go about stuff. So we went around Rems, bit of a tangent there. Went around Rems and then um, the tunnel wasn't until about 11 o'clock that night. And so we thought, oh, well, you know, we've got the times our own, what should we do? Let's drive to Bruges, which isn't in France, um, because we wanted some chocolate. So we drove from Rems to Bruges, which is quite a long way, but it's not crazy. Bruges isn't a million miles from Calais, so. And then when we were in Bruges, we sat down, we went to an Italian restaurant, uh, Da Mario, I think it was called. Um, really, really nice food. Really nice food in the little square in Bruges. Um, got some chocolates. And there I found another um, Clement item, if you like. I found more stuff about Clement, uh, DS's, uh, in Bruges than I did in Paris. Like in Paris, it was nothing. 
um, Bruges I did find something and then after Bruges we mooched about and uh, went back to the car and thought hmm got a little while yet let's drive to the Netherlands so we drove to the Netherlands to a little town called Sluis I think it was pronounced uh, because it was not far over the border and I've never driven through Netherlands before I've been to Netherlands been to Amsterdam and all sorts but only on boats I've never been in a car um, their roundabout was better than ours straight away they've got like separated a lot of them have got like separate curbs in the middle so cars that want to go straight on go on that side of it and cars that want to turn that way go on that side of it so you can't do that stupid thing Brits do where they go and cross over a lane and come back out again so yeah I went to Amsterdam and that ended up being a really pretty place as well and then it was off to the tunnel um, the train on the way back was good uh, the train on the way out um, a few trains after ours it broke down and everyone had to get out the emergency door and walk through the service tunnel so that was exciting for them didn't happen with us um, the c6 didn't break down the train did yeah the train on the way back was uneventful and then um, no nothing really more to note than that um, have, the only thing when we got off the train got waylaid on the m25 um, because the A3 had been closed uh, between Guildford and the M25 so I had to go down the A326 through I don't know where we went through somewhere came out onto the A3 my wife had fallen asleep and this car has two speed limiters the built-in one and her and uh, she'd fallen asleep and it was well let's put it this way when I entered the A3, um, my ETA uh, to get home was two minutes past one. And I pulled up in our road at 13 minutes to one, just from the A3. Because there weren't many people on it. And that is a hell of a machine. That, I've never been able to do anything like that. I mean, I've, done, I've gone down roads at night when I wanted to get home in cars like a BX or something like that and felt, wow, these are really stable, really planted. But that is something else. I, and I was, I mean, hanging back. I could have quite easily, there, there are stretches on the A3, you could quite easily double the national speed limit and probably keep it fairly safe around corners. There were some where you wouldn't, but, and, and it just, it was, it's just, effortless you know you're driving down the roads and you think i don't need a car that's got all the feedback and the tingling through the steering i want that because i just point that and it just goes and i hit a bump mid bend it doesn't go Ugh! it just just deals with it um fun times in france so getting on, on and off the tunnel watching the x5 in front of me going crashing over the joins in the coaches and then this just sort of going that was interesting. Um, watching the, the S-Class, uh, Mercedes S-Class in front of me on the Contraflow in, in the UK when we got off. Get doing that, porpoising, as Mercedes tend to do. And uh, yeah, and this was just sort of sat there like, what, what are you finding? I don't think the suspension is 100% right in that, um, but I don't think it's a million miles off. So if you're doing a trip around France and you're planning to take a Citroen C6, is it easy? Um, it's cramped. For a family of five, yeah, it's cramped. The boot was absolutely rammed. If you see the picture of what we had in the S-Max and then how it looked in this, and that's after we'd stripped half the stuff we had, like we had a pack of 24 cans of Tango, we split it down to 12, things like that. But the boot is now empty. I've emptied it, and in it I have some stuff. I have three items. First off, I went to a Leclerc supermarket in, uh, in Vendy um, and wanted to find something personalised. A special keychain for a special car. There were no Hildas. Um, then in uh, Paris, hence the bag, you see, souvenirs of Paris. All souvenir, souvenir shops in Paris sell the same stuff as each other. Um, but this one sold something else. My wife is exceptionally excited to find this. Look at that. That's going to have to go inclement. Um, inclement. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, 
that's actually notable because Clement is from Paris, born there. And lastly, in Bruges, of all places, well, no, actually, in Bruges, I'll tell you what I found. I found a Clement, a toy Clement, the, the colour, Delta Blue, in the window of a shop. And I oh, it's a Clement. I went into the shop. See the guy in the shop. Look at all the toy cars. No DSs. Only the one in the window. You've got a DS in the window. I didn't say you've got a Clement in the window, because you'd be like, what? How much is that Clement in the window? Oh, no, we haven't got any more of them. Can I buy that one? Uh, no. I think it's because he couldn't get to it. I think that's what it was. The language barrier was slightly difficult, but he basically couldn't get to uh, the Clement in the window. Devastated, I had to leave it there. It was about that big. So, but uh, what I did find is there's a shop in Bruges that sells like rock t-shirts and stuff, which I quite like, but look. It's a Clement. It's not, it's a DS21. It's not a D Super 5, but it's pretty close to being a Clement, to be fair. Um, and uh, I think that is the same uh, brand of sign as the SM one I got in Danan a little while ago, so that will go in the bay. Uh, that one was actually a bit like the one in the window. Um, it was the only one in the shop. Uh, but unlike the model car, or the toy car as it was, um, we said to the young lady, can I have the one in the window, I'll buy that from you? And she said, yes, the young lady said yes, which is not something that ever normally happened to me. Um, very much the opposite, um, but uh, back in the days. But yes, we're sorted. So, some stuff there, some toys, um, nothing SM related anywhere, apart from uh, a completely different sort of shop um, that I noticed, which I didn't want to take my kids into. But that, yeah, that's about the size of it. I mean, it did ever so well. There are leaves in here. These are from the campsite in Vendy. Um, they were falling off a tree. Um, no, actually, no, they're from the campsite uh, near Bernie Riviere, it was. Yeah, I mean, it's not a tiny boot, but it's it's amazing how quickly you fill that with a big suitcase. I mean, five people travelled in this. And, I mean, this is as it was. Oh, oh these are evil. The sun, it's one of them. But, yeah, I had to buy some shoulder pads for the kids because they were... Uh, chafing their necks. I mean, that is not a seat, is it? There's my hand. Well, there's a drumstick. So yeah, there's a there's a drumstick for reference. We're not measuring in London buses or football pitches in drumsticks. That's how big that seat is, and my poor kids had to sit in that. You basically you, your bum ends up about there, and you kind of like lean against the back. I mean, you got full seat belt and everything, but it's a joke. I mean, they could have done better, honestly. Um, still full of crud that you would take uh, that you would see on a family holiday dust dirt everywhere all the crap look there you go there's a tunnel pass for for the euro tunnel uh, yeah just litter everywhere but didn't it do well my god didn't it do well it has eaten its tyres completely. Uh, this bit here feels like it's not supposed to be there. And uh, the tread has disappeared completely. Um, it could be a tracking issue. I've set the track in myself, but they were pretty heavily worn around the edge anyway. And the problem you've got when setting the track in on one of these is that when it goes above a certain speed, it lowers slightly. And of course that alters the tracking. So your tracking settings are only ever gonna be a best guess. There's a, the last minute Crit Air sticker that I had to get put in it, which isn't a sticker, it's a bit of paper that's stuck in by two bits of Starburst, um, because uh, we didn't have time. The sticker will arrive, it will be posted. Just leaves everywhere, it's just, but it's done it. I mean, you know, nearly 40 to the, well it was over 40 to the gallon on average for the whole trip, all 1600 odd miles, and just over 40 to the gallon until my black down the A3 on the way home knocked it just under. But uh, in the kilometers in France, it was about, uh, it's anywhere between 13.7 and 14.5 kilometers per litre. So um, it's just done amazingly well. What a thing, 750 quid for a car that people run a million miles from. And it just did a last minute 
no preparation trip. I mean, you know, 1,600 miles isn't a long way for a car, to be honest, but normally you like to check them over and everything first. Nope, wasn't even cleaned. Just hop in and away you go. No checks, no fluid levels, nothing. Even the tyres hadn't been done. Got there and the tyres, I think two of the tyres are flat. I think I had to put more out. In fact, that one's gone. Has that gone down again? And that's going down a bit. Yeah. I'm going to treat it to a big wash because it's filthy dirty as well. It's absolutely disgusting. Problem is, it, look at the seatbelt. Oh, diseased. The problem is, you can't clean it. It's really difficult to clean. So, there's the mileage now, nearly on 160,000. It was 157 something when we left. Thank you for the holiday, C6, you did very well. And thank you for the memories. But I suppose, of course, uh, the main thanks goes to you for watching. Why you would want to watch me talk about my holiday, I don't know. Um, maybe you didn't, maybe this will get no views at all, but don't knock it till you tried it, honestly. 750 pounds. It's just taking me around France. That's a car that people run a million miles from. No need for it. Get a C6. No, no, don't. I'm not telling you to get a C6. Consider getting a C6. Cheers.